When it comes to ranking Star Wars movies, Return of the Jedi usually doesn't come out on top on many people's lists. I would even go as far as to say that of the three original films, it is clearly the weakest. Regardless of that, Return of the Jedi will always have a special place in my heart as it was the first Star Wars film that I actually saw in the theater. Like any movie, it's got its high points and low points, but there is one aspect of Return of the Jedi that most haters point to as the film's biggest downfall. The introduction of the Ewoks. First of all, I get it. Small furry little dudes aren't everybody's cup of tea. And I get the maddening notion that a bunch of small primitive creatures could defeat fully armed stormtroopers, speeder bikes, and at ST walkers. Supposedly, Lucas's original plan was to have the final battle done against Wookiees. But more than that, he really wanted the climactic battle to be between a technologically superior army and a less advanced, primitive band of warriors, with the latter coming out on top. Basically your classic David vs Goliath scenario. Unfortunately, as the films progressed, Chewbacca showcased that a Wookiee isn't quite as primitive as one might think. I mean, can you pilot the Millennium Falcon? Thus the need to create a new alien species to battle against the Empire. Enter the Ewoks. If you really tried, you could come up with a number of logical reasons on how the Ewoks could realistically defeat the Empire troops. I'll give you three right off the bat. First, home court advantage. It was their forest. Second, numbers. And third, the element of surprise. And if that is not enough reason to convince you, here's a detail that most people tend to forget. The Ewoks actually didn't win. For a moment, the Empire did take back the advantage and had the Ewoks on the run and the Rebellion leaders held at ATST gunpoint. That is, until it was revealed that the ATST was actually pirated by Chewie and a couple of Ewoks, Willy and Wonka in case you're wondering. But had Chewie and Co not done what they did, I believe that the Ewoks most likely would have lost. Anyway, in case you're still wondering, I don't share the Ewok dislike. I was 7 when I saw Return of the Jedi and as many point out, the perfect target audience for Ewoks. I loved them. The Ewoks were the first Return of the Jedi action figures I sought out and naturally, Wicket was my favorite. Not just favorite Ewok, but favorite action figure in my collection for quite some time. There was a time when I lived and breathed Ewoks. I walked around and talked like an Ewok, yub nub, we chihuahua. I watched Return of the Jedi over and over again just to see Bikini Slave, I mean the Ewoks. And I even enjoyed the two made for TV Ewok adventure movies that followed. Rest in peace, Chuka Truck. Anyway, years later as an older collector, I made it a point to avoid getting back into Star Wars. Aside from not wanting to fall into another collecting rabbit hole, with so many newer figures released during my hiatus, I really had no idea where I could start even if I wanted to. Yes, the thought of only collecting the Ewoks crossed my head numerous times and I managed to resist. My resolve came close to falling so many times. I even remember actually holding a Hasbro Star Wars Legacy, Pap Blue and Noah Pack 2 pack, and literally walking up to the counter to pay for it when I eventually held my ground and promptly returned it back to the shelf. But Hasbro finally got me when they released a vintage collection Wicket in 2010. I mean, he looked like he literally stepped out of the movie screen, hungry for some rebel crackers. How could I resist? The moment I saw him in a store, I didn't hesitate and scooped him up. And for the longest time, he stood proudly displayed next to my computer as the lone Ewok in my room. Then one day, on one of my toy hunts, I spotted the new updated vintage collection Low Grey and I thought to myself, hmm, Wicket has been looking rather lonely by himself on the desk. And just like that, the Empire Bunker that guarded the energy shield generator to my resolve was opened up and I too fell to the primitive might of the Ewoks. Anyway, a few months later as my Ewok collection started growing, I started thinking of ways to properly display them. I thought about getting them a vintage Ewok playset and headed over to eBay to see exactly how much those playsets were going for. Back then, the average going rate for a secondhand complete set turned out to be a little bit more than I was willing to spend about $100 or even more if it included the original box. So I left it at that. Until I came upon this one auction that was ending in a few hours, whose current bid was around $20. I figured, what the hell? I placed a max bid of $50 and went to bed thinking, I'd never win. 
Then the next morning, I received a pleasant surprise. I now own the Niwok Village. So now that I was a proud owner of some Endor real estate, I figured why not go the extra mile and spruce it up and make it more fitting for a bunch of modern Ewoks. For what it is, the vintage Ewok Village is a pretty nice place set. It's definitely a pretty decent size and has enough room for a good number of Ewoks. And while it isn't initially obvious, one thing it definitely had going for was its excellent sculpt. Although most playsets back in the 80s weren't too overly complicated in order to keep costs down, many of them, especially the original Kenner Star Wars line, had excellent sculpts. Unfortunately, most of the sculpted details were lost due to very little or no paint apps used in the final product. Most playsets back then were just cast in the closest basic color they needed to be and they relied on stickers to add more details. So yeah, the Ewok Village looked really nice. And looking closely at the pieces, I could see that Kenner sculpted out some nice looking trees with textured bark and little foliage at the roots. The wooden platform and structures like the support beams, railings, throne and elevator came complete with even more sculpted details like ropes binding the different pieces together. Even the stone fire pit had some nice texturing going on. Unfortunately, all of these nice details were lost because they were left unpainted. And because the playset was plastic, it had that typical plastic sheen when light shined on it, making it really look like a toy. I knew I had to do something about that. Prior to this, I had done a handful of customizing, but mostly just action figures. I had never done a complete playset, so this was something new and a welcome challenge. So here's a step-by-step -step on what I did to make this playset come to life. Turned out, it wasn't too difficult, and in all modesty, the results even surprised me. Step 1. Darkening and Dulling First things first, I had to get rid of the plastic shine, so I coated all the pieces with some dull black spray paint. Initially, I thought I had to paint all the pieces completely black to give a basic coat or primer for the succeeding layers of paint to properly stick onto. I was pleasantly surprised to find that I didn't really need to do that and the spare spraying of the black paint was good enough to overall darken all the pieces, take away the shine, but still allow the original brown from the plastic to come through. Step 2. Bringing out the highlights. Dry brushing is a technique where you take a paintbrush, put as little paint as possible on it, and just lightly brush along the surface of what you're painting, as if you're dusting it. It's a common technique used by most customizers to highlight more details already present on their toys. And better yet, it's deceptively simple, but the end results can be quite stunning. Step 3. Detailing. This is where being OC really helps out. Painting all the ropes and leaves and other small details was admittedly difficult and tedious, but all the effort was really worth it. This is the last part that made my village playset pop. And just like that, I had a proper Ewok village that my little dudes could call home. I was so pleased and excited about the end result that I started getting more things to add on to my village. An additional log, an Ewok glider and catapult, a speeder bike, an ATST walker, both captured by the Ewoks, as well as some rebels to roast and a golden idol to worship. And pretty soon it became apparent that my little playset was just that. Little. So after a few months, after patiently scouring eBay, I got myself a second Ewok village at an even better price to add on to my first one. So there you go, from one lone wicked figure to a full-on Star Wars Endor diorama. And now all I needed were a few more Ewoks. Hello, slippery slope. Fortunately, back then, eBay was littered with lots of loose Ewoks for sale. Most of these Ewoks were of dubious origins. Factory reruns, maybe? being sold by sellers from China and Hong Kong, and they basically came with incomplete or mismatched accessories, which was fine by me. All I cared about was they were cheap and plentiful. Of course, these Ewoks weren't meant to be displayed as is. For some of these Ewoks, a simple switching around of gear and weapons gave me new unique characters. But for the most part, I wanted even more diversity. So I let my creative juices flow and got to painting others. Still, after all that painting, I felt that I could take it up yet another level, using some epoxy putty to add even more unique details. By no means am I an expert in sculpting, but it doesn't take much skill to add a bigger nose or a little more sculpted hair. Anyway, I thought to document one of the more extensive Ewok makeovers that I did. First, the epoxy sculpt. For this particular one, I really went overboard, basically covering the entire original head. As you can see with the base figure next to him, the original had an unusually small head which gave me more room to work with. I used a cheap sculpting tool that I got in a school supply store to carve out their hair detail. 
I also used some of the epoxy sculpt to place additional details on his hood, nothing too over the top. With all the added details done and dried, all that was left was to paint. For this project, I used mostly flat paints to counter the plastic shine, but for some portions, I made the mistake of using glossy paints on many of the Ewok clothes, so they came out a little extra shiny and looking extra plasticky. Anyway, here's a new Ewok, newly assembled next to the original mold. I'd say that's different enough. I also gave him his own unique weapon using epoxy sculpt again for the spearhead. And there you have it, a brand new Ewok. Anyway, I'll end this episode with shots of a few more custom Ewoks I came up with to populate my village. Yub nub. So are there any more owners of some prime Endor real estate out there? Who else has a tribe of Ewoks residing in their homes? Let me know in the comments below and tell me your story. Thanks for watching Stories from the Toy Shelf. If you enjoyed this story, why not check another one? And please help me out by giving me a like or comment and subscribe to the channel to get notifications whenever I upload a new story. Until the next one.